Joining me today for the St Andrews Economist Scotland's Place in the UK Summit is the leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, Willie Rennie, MSP. As a keen runner and known for his eye-catching photo opportunities during elections on his Instagram page, which I uh, advise our viewers to follow to see lots of videos every day, Willie Rennie has been the leader uh, of his party at West at Holyrood rather, for 10 years. At the last election, he was re-elected with a convincing majority of the North East Fife electorate to represent the constituency home to the University of St Andrews, where he is right now, and of course, uh, the St Andrews Economist as well. Today, we will discuss Scotland's place in the UK. We are delighted that you're joining us today for the summit. I want to start this discussion with you, uh, your upbringing, your background, your early life, to find where the Willie Rennie story fits into the wider story of the Scottish independence debate. So you're a Fifer, born and bred, growing up in Strathmiglo with a family grounded in community. To what extent did your early life, your parents, the sense of community you had growing up inform your politics? Yeah, I think very much so. I mean, my, my dad was the grocer, my grandfather was the minister, my mother was involved in the community association. So public service was really important to us and it was really important to me, helping out people who were maybe less fortunate than ourselves. And, being in the shop, and I used to work in the shop as a as a boy, you would see all walks of life, people who were, you know, struggling, people who find it difficult to make ends meet, you know, various people with different health problems, alcohol problems, you know, you saw kind of life in, in the raw. And, you know, Shadiglo was by no means, you know, a deprived community, but it had its pockets of, of deprivation um, and poverty. And so we saw that. And so I had a social conscience, cared about the people next door, but also had a, a view in the world that it was more than Shathmiglo or Fife or Scotland, but we were kind of global citizens. I would never have expressed it in that way as a boy, but I always felt, and I was taught by my parents, to think bigger, to think about the world, to think about the alternative point of view, and don't just think that you've got all the answers. So there was a there was a kind of an internationalism about my parents. And then again, they would never express it that way. But equally, it was important to have that value instilled in me. Mm -hmm. So I, I get a sense there, you're kind of hinting to your your sort of, your, your identity, as it were, your, your political identity, your cultural identity. Did you see yourself then, and obviously now as well, yourself as Scottish, British, European, internationally, as you, you just said there, or is it is it more complicated? Is it a mix of both, perhaps? I, identity was not something that I bothered about. It was, it's only, I mean, I suppose identity has always been important for lots of people, but it was never that important to me. I knew who I was. I knew where I lived. I knew that there was a big world out there that I wanted to experience. And trying to mark yourself out as different from somebody else was never something I bothered about. I mean, we were growing up in the in the 70s, you know, of course we knew there was a thing called Scottish nationalism, but it never dominated in the way that it does now. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole anti-Europeanism was not something that dominated. I mean, I, I was completely bemused that people had such a, an antipathy towards our neighbours in Europe. I couldn't understand why Absolutely. that would be the case, but, but there was a, you know, people seem nowadays to to rely more on identity than they do on sometimes on values. And I think that's regrettable. Mm -hmm. um, but Scottish nationalism was was alien to me mm -hmm. in the 70s. It's not you know, who I was or wanted to be. Mm -hmm. So I, let me just change tack every so slightly. That was uh, an interesting point there. Focusing kind of on your view and your formation of your view of the economy. You touched on it a little bit there. What did you learn from that? You know, you, you touched on your parents and your upbringing. You're seeing all these people from different walks of life. Was it an influence that you kind of felt that you had to work hard and graft to get on in life? Yeah. Well, my, I mean, my dad was, I mean, he's still alive. Um, he's in his 80s now. But boy, did he work hard to get the business going. And so hard work was something that was at the center of my being just putting in the graph, putting in the hours, you know, encouraging others to do the same, but having a care for those workers and the customers that came into the business, making sure that government 
helped, but wasn't too overbearing or interventionist. You know, I believed in the free market and the ability of markets to do good things, but equally, I wanted the state to be there to pick people up. So it was that very much kind of strong economy, fair society stuff that we've talked about before. I mean, again, you'd never express it that way when you were a boy, um, but that's really what it was about. You know, I, I couldn't really understand why I, I was never a socialist. I never had this, um, this aggression towards the ruling class as such, but equally I was never part of the ruling class either. You know, I believed in rubbing along with everybody and trying to make society work to the best of its can, as, as flat as it could be. But, but equally, I never thought the country, the, the state should run everything mm -hmm. because there were some really imaginative people who had some brilliant businesses. So mm -hmm. I tried to look at things at face value, what people would contribute. But hard work was very much at the center of it. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think, I mean, you're talking essentially there about a meritocracy. Uh, do you, did yeah. you think that when you were growing up, even your adult life and education work, that you benefited for, from some sort of meritocracy? And do you think if, if it was the case, then is it still the case now in Scotland? I think it's more so now than it was. I mean, I've seen some people from, you know, some really deprived backgrounds getting on extraordinarily well in life. Because society has now, I think, recognised that the old ways, the class system, in which there was elements of it still around, you know, very recently, and in some ways still are. It's who you know rather than what you can do. But I think it's broken down more than it probably has been for some time. I mean, I'm, I mean, St Andrews sometimes gets a bad name for, you know, um, being at a kind of an elitist organisation. But I have to say, the way that St Andrews has gone about trying to break that down is really impressive mm -hmm. just reaching out into all sorts of communities prepared to go anywhere to recruit people and to get the best people to come to the institution i think is hugely commendable um, and I, I think they're doing a fantastic job of breaking down that image about what the institution is it's about being the best not being about being the elite and i i think it's in a model for others to follow um so yeah no i I think there were still elements when I was growing up about, you know, it's, it's who you know rather than what you know. But I think increasingly that is getting broken down and the state and the establishment is helping to break that down. You, you talk there a little bit, you just said there about the state. Um, I, I, I believe you've been quite a, a critic in some ways, obviously in a, in a very uh, progressive sense about the way, I mean, the Scottish government has been handling uh, the poverty related attainment gap. Do you, do you worry that there are not enough prog progress is being made there? Uh, hugely. Um, I mean, the, this is a difference between a government. Like, governments are supposed to do difficult things, aren't they? I mean, that's, that's the role. They're not always supposed to just be popular and be liked by everybody. They're supposed to go and do things for the long term that benefit society as a whole, even if it means their short-term popularity gets hit. That's, that's what governments are about. This government has broken all those rules. This government just hunts, it courts popularity constantly. It never makes any difficult decisions for Two the longer years. term. And, and as a result, what you've got is a poverty-related attainment gap that is stubbornly high. They've made it worse. They've, they've actually ingrained disadvantage into the system. Um, you know, you, you, there's lots of different kind of, you might call them, um, you know, retail politics, we would call it, where there's offers for, you know, take the tolls on the bridge. You know, I, I, I didn't like the tolls on the fourth road bridge. I didn't think they were the best thing in the world to do. Was it really a priority to remove them? Probably not. Um, but this government was determined to absolutely do it. You know, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I would bring them back. Of course not. But it's hardly the most progressive thing in the world. Um, is to remove tolls on the bridge, but that's what they branded themselves at for ages. It just so I want a bit more focus on trying to break down the barriers to people achieving things. And you know, we spent six years trying to get them to adopt what they call now the pupil equity fund or the pupil premium that was in England. Mm -hmm. Why on earth we didn't do that at an earlier stage? I don't know. Nursery education, very sluggish rollout. 
two-year-old take-up, very poor. So all those things are the fundamentals of changing the way that society works and so that poorer kids can get a chance in life. But this government have relegated them to, to less of a priority than tools on the bridge. So, I mean, we're kind of talking a little bit there about social justice in a sense, um, which I believe is something that you, you, you care strongly about. I believe also the SNP is broadly supportive of too. When, I mean, Nicola Sturgeon once said in arguing for independence, and I quote, you cannot guarantee social justice unless you're in control of delivery. I guess that's quite a characteristic thing for them to argue that surely independence would be the best way to have full control over all the levers of power so that you can ensure social justice. Yeah, it's the answer to everything. Every known problem on the world would be solved by Scottish independence. I mean, the reality is we're an interconnected world, both economically, but also socially and culturally. And we need to work in partnership. And the idea that all these problems would be solved by breaking off is just nonsense. And um, we've seen with Brexit how it's such a distraction. We should be working with our partners in Europe. But equally, that applies to our partners in the rest of the United Kingdom. That's how you deal with social justice, is you work together in partnership. Whereas the SNP are using poverty, are using the gaps in education, are using the, um, the issues around defence and so on in order to advance their obsession, which is independence. And the, the idea that it would be easy I think has been disproven by the, the whole Brexit shambles. So I, I just think it would set us back in our mission of getting social justice rather than advance it. Let me, let me push you on one thing. Um, you're broadly supportive, I believe, of the universal basic income. Yes. Does the Scottish government have all the power it needs to implement that? No. It could do elements of it, but no, it doesn't. And it needs to work harder at getting the UK government to buy into this. Um, mm -hmm. But it just writes that off. It has no interest in trying to persuade Boris Johnson. They just say, no, he's not going to be interested in this. Where's the hard graft behind the scenes to try and persuade them to do a pilot to make it work? Mm -hmm. Why not embarrass them privately into making this work? No, they're all about show and division. They, again, it's using the universal basic income, which will be an important part of tackling poverty in order to advance the cause of independence. Actually, you would go as far as saying they'd be quite upset if Boris Johnson agreed to do it because it wouldn't <laughs> help them in their cause. Which is a shame, of course. But, but, you know, it's just everything is seen through the prism of independence. So right. why not try and work with the UK government to make some of these things work rather than hunting for the disagreements? That's all they're interested in. And that's, you know, and the UK government see that as well. And they think, well, why should we trust these people if all they're going to do is use everything that we try and cooperate on as a badge for independence? That, it just gets in the way of absolutely everything. Right. And that, I suppose, let me just pivot further on in your, in your career. When you were working, I think, just after you'd served as an MP from 2006 to 2010, you were a special government advisor in the Scottish office. Is that right? And uh, was, was there talk even back then? So this is a couple of years, they've just, I suppose, in 2011, the SNP had just got their landslide victory. Was there talk then about independence? Was there talk about what a strategy might be to, to, counter, to, to counter that, uh, that argument at all? No. No, there wasn't. Um, it was... Uh, you, you probably won't remember, but about six months before that election in May 2011, the Labour Party were riding high. Labour had just lost power in Westminster, but in Scotland they were still up at, what, 50% of the polls. They were going to romp at home, they were going to oust the Nationalist government, and we were talking about the possibility of having a coalition with Labour. They might even be able to do it by themselves, was the talk at that time. And then the question shifted. And the nationalists just robbed home. So there was no preparation. There was no work done in advance of all that. Nobody really expected the SNP um, to get that majority. But in the end, it was accepted because they had a very clear mandate to be able to put the, the question to the, to the people. So there was no preparation in advance. And there was a kind of a reluctance to, you know, remember, we were in the middle of the recession. Yes. So there was no, there was no real 
um, desire to get involved in those arguments. Mm -hmm. Let me let me you know move a little bit forward. Then you've you've talked, I think, in the past at least about opportunity getting you into politics. And during the EU referendum, you were on the Remain side, which argued that Brexit would leave young people like me and my fellow students in Andrews and other uh, universities as well with fewer opportunities. So, so my question to you then is, would rejoining the EU as an independent Scotland be the best way to regain these opportunities? Um, I think that's one option, and it's something that I would favour at some point. Uh, I think we need to persuade people across the country of the merits of being in a partnership with the European Union. There may be incremental steps that we can take to repair some of that damage, and we've got to mitigate as much as we possibly can to make sure that we can get the benefits of the European Union, even if we're not in the European Union, at least in the short term. So I would favour, at some point, being able to persuade people but we need to recognise that we lost the argument um, and that the country wants to move on. Um, and what we need to do is to persuade them over a period of time that they should be members of the European Union because there is very clear benefits. And the promises that were made by Boris Johnson and others about the great new brave world that we get um, with uh, outside the European Union mm -hmm. have not really come up with much. Now, interesting that you mentioned that. Um, although you know Brexit has in many in many ways put independence back on the table, um, and it's made it perhaps more likely, but it's also made it more difficult. You know the economic difficulties which rejoining the EU in an independence government would would mean would make the you know they've made the compli they've, they've complicated the argument in a sense. I mean, let me just give you three. You know, in terms of currency it's highly unlikely that an independent Scotland could rejoin until it has, it, has its own currency and full control of its monetary policy, of which Nicola Sturgeon's own commission said it would take at least five, if not 10 years. In terms of deficit, there would, be, there would have to be contractual macroeconomic policy to satisfy the EU stability pact, and that's just austerity in all but name. And perhaps most pressing of all is the EU's external border at Gretna, which would increase trade fictions with the rest of the UK. So here's the point. Do you get a sense of deja vu with these economic implications for independence with the Brexit process? Are the SNP effectively turning a blind eye to the same arguments that they made for Brexit, against Brexit? It, it is astonishing how similar the arguments are. Um, and it's astonishing how they use the same arguments that Nigel Farage and others use to dismiss those arguments. That those are doom mongers, they're doomsters, gloomsters, um, the experts, who needs them? You know, there's, there's all that. Those arguments are coming uh, back again. So I think there's, for me, um, I think there's an argument to be made around not repeating the mistakes of Brexit. And I think with some people, that works. But with others, there's an emotional argument that they've been torn out of the European Union against their will. And my job is to persuade those people that actually breaking up the United Kingdom would compound that rather than making it easier. Now, you, you remember Alex Salmon's vision for an independent Scotland and getting there was all about a kind of gradual separation over time. So you were going to perhaps even share some institutions on welfare and other things like on foreign affairs, embassies and so on. You would have a gradual separation. And that was all possible because just like Northern Ireland, would be in the cradle of the European Union. So you could gradually separate over time in a, oh, not, I wouldn't say gentle, but more gentle than is certainly possible now. But as soon as you have got a choice to make between the European Union and Britain, and the more Britain goes off in that direction, the harder it is to say, Right, we're going to have a gradual separation, which is more gentle and safer over a period of time when you've suddenly got to choose the other side with the European Union. So the harder Brexit is, the more the harder the form of Brexit that we choose, the more difficult right. in practical terms achieving an independent Scotland would be. Mm -hmm. So I think the arguments against independence are even stronger than they were before. Mm -hmm. Okay, so given all that, Nevertheless, um, the union, I think you'd probably agree, is at its strongest when all the nations hold the same values, the aims, and they're bounded by a, a shared sense of identity. But when Scotland has policies and values imposed on it, 
the union's at its weakest. So we can, you know, we can think of Thatcher's poll tax in the past had significant ramifications for Scottish politics, but also Brexit now. Given your view of to persuade people over time of the merits of rejoining, are you at all worried that the consequences of Brexit, which of course are still unfolding, are going to seal the deal for Scottish independence, regardless of what the conversation we've just had? Support for independence should be at 90% by now. I mean, if you look at it, we should, with Boris Johnson in charge, with Brexit being delivered, with the Conservatives having an 80-seat majority, you would have thought, with all those arguments being all in the favour, you might argue, in, in favour of independence, that they should be up there at 90%, but they're not. I mean, they're actually, they've lost support in the last year. They're behind um, the pro-UK um, vote. So um, how on earth are they going to get, what other argument are they going to deploy in order to get it above the 50% mark? And even then, if you, you know, an independent Scotland to be successful, we need a good fair wind. We need everybody behind it. How on earth do you do that with 50% plus one vote? I mean, it's hardly yes. the best grounds upon which to try and achieve an independent Scotland. So no, I, I think it's not, the issue that's tipped them over the edge. They thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think the Scottish Parliament is quite flat just now. But if I can deal, I know you want to move on. Uh -huh. If I can deal with um, the Cheshire and Aberson by-election win will actually make people think a little bit. Um, whilst Boris Johnson is making strides into the north of England, that's true. He's actually losing support in his backyard in the south. Right. Now, you know, you would think progressives in Scotland we'd hope that the United Kingdom is not lost to the progressives across the country. And I think the Chesham and Amersham by-election might make them think a little bit that actually there may be mis there perhaps is hope for the future of the United Kingdom as a progressive nation rather than one that's dominated by nationalist Boris Johnson. Okay. Well, let's, let's move a little bit further closer to, to where we are now. So it's now just over a month since the Scottish Parliament election and the COVID election turned out with, as you just said, a parliament which has pretty much the same arithmetic. Nothing much really has changed, uh, to coin a phrase. It seems the election wasn't only just about COVID. I mean, across the UK, the governmental responses have shown devolution in action. Arguably, it's been the most visible exercising of power in Scotland. What do you say to the majority of Scots who believe that Sturgeon handled the pandemic far better than Johnson, at least in terms of communication and trust. And they've concluded that maybe more decisions should be made in Scotland. And if they were, they would make their lives better. Yeah, I don't think that people made the, and I analyzed the COVID response and said, yes, I want independence. I think with some, it might have made a bit of a difference. I think generally people thought, I, the most common phrase I get, actually, on the doorsteps is, I've got to give her credit. She handled it well. Mm -hmm. She was very clear. She was cautious. But I don't support independence, and I don't support them. So although there was a bit of admiration for certainly her daily communications and the caution, I don't think it cut over right. into support for independence in the way that she wanted. Mm -hmm. Um. When you became leader of the Scottish Liberal Democrats, you said that you'd be working with your colleagues to stand up to the SNP bulldozer. In 2011, you had five Lib Dem MP MSPs. Now you've got four. Are the Lib Dems still relevant in Scotland? And yeah. would you nope. say that they have better electoral chances in an, in, in an independent Scotland? Even if it meant we had 100% of the seats in an independent Scotland, I still wouldn't support it. It's not something that would persuade me to, uh, to go down that route. But no, I think the, the party's in a stronger position than when I took office. Um, we had a really tough year in uh, 2015, and we lost lots of seats. But we started winning back seats in 2016, we lost the previous year. We won at Westminster, we won in Europe, we've won in council elections and by-elections. We're in a better shape than we were. You know, we struggled for a long time with the consequences of the coalition. Right. I think this campaign was positive, it was optimistic, and I think it set the foundation for the future. Yes, I was disappointed we went back, but in terms of majorities in our seats, 
it shows that where we can convince people we can win, mm-hmm. we win big. Yeah. You know, I've got a majority double that what I had the previous time. Edinburgh West, most the more mm-hmm. votes than any MSP has ever got is what we got in um, Edinburgh West. So we we have made a big impact. We just need to make more. Do you, do you think, looking back, that you underestimated the tactical voting on the unionist side? Uh, no, I didn't underestimate it. I knew there was a lot of it going there. Yeah, I knew. I mean, we benefited in some areas. The Tories yeah. benefited in others. So, no, I knew. I've been around for too long not to notice these things. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Looking kind of holistically then and moving away from uh, your party, with the SNP falling short of an overall majority by one seat, the debate over a supported a supposed mandate to hold a second independence referendum has dominated the debate since you know the results were known. While there may not be an SNP majority, and of course the precedent of 2011 matters in this debate, there is a majority in Hollywood for independence, given that both the SNP and the Greens ran on a manifesto commitment to hold another referendum. In May, you told Sky News' Sophie Ridge that you wouldn't support an independence referendum, and I quote, under any circumstances and at any time. Are the Liberals, Democrats, really in keeping with their name if they stand in the way of what Nicholas Sturgeon would call in the, the will of the people? So if I stand in an election and say I'm going to do something, it would be anti-democratic if I did the opposite once I got elected. So I will never support an independence referendum because that's what I said during the election. Now, Nicola and Patrick and others are perfectly entitled to argue that they should have an independence referendum. But there is an important thing to remember. Nicola, during the election, pivoted away from independence and a referendum. She tried to reassure people that it wasn't going to happen immediately. She said she would get through the pandemic first because she knew that her position of an immediate referendum was unpopular. So their mandate is not as clean as as they would claim it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let me let me push you a bit. When you when you look at the polling of this, I mean, if before the election, if you looked at the polling where you had the, the scenario in which which has been realised with the SNP with a full majority, right, versus where, where we are now, which is the SNP Greens, the, the support for a mandate actually slips down. Does that tell you a lot about the 2011 precedent? Where you know, I think it pretty much in the whole Westminster and Holyrood, there was that dual consent. I think pretty much the whole Hollywood at the time, all the parties voted. Do you worry if they were to push ahead with this in, in the years to come, that it would be so divisive for Hollywood and what's going on there? Yeah, I think it would. And I think it would be divisive in the country as well. Um, I think there is a, an incredulity amongst lots of people that in the middle of a global pandemic when thousands of people are dying, that you would ever pursue this issue. And no matter how hard they try, till they're blue in the face, and they say that, no, 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 it's consistent with the recovery rather than being contrary to the recovery, people don't buy it. So I think there's a danger, not just that it would divide Holyrood, but it will cause the SNP significant problems. This is their chance. And they know if they push it at the wrong time, they won't win. That's why I actually don't think ultimately... Nicola will pursue this because she understands that she would lose. And you'll notice that the closer to get people get to answer the question about independence, the more that support declines. And that's what she knows. She needs to build up a big majority in the polls before she asks this question in order to be sure that she's going to get it over the line. And that's not there. Yeah. Just to carry on from there, so you, the country, I mean, it's pretty much split. If you look to the, the, the vote for, uh, I think, the constituencies versus the, the, um, the, the additional member system part of that was, you know, whichever way you looked at it, it was pretty much split 50-50 if you could take uh, each vote to be uh, a cast in, in the sense yeah. of independence, if you could. Um, and as you say, I mean, holding a referendum would be risky for Johnson as well. For Sturgeon, I mean, I think to, to the, the bigger thing here is the, as we talked about earlier, the economic arguments aren't ready yet. They've had seven years, I would say, to, to, to mass them, and I don't think they've got it yet. I mean, the growth commission is out, out of date as well. So that's, I think, where the difficulty lies. I mean, certainly seven years on, with Brexit, Johnson's popularity, in terms of uh, the, the, the coronavirus crisis, in some sense have 
I would say, added to um, Sturgeon's arguments and representatives of sovereignty. Now, you can debate whether you think it's made as big a difference as they had thought. But, you know, the, the point is, you know, they, they, their difficulty lies in the economics end of it. For unionists, do you worry that they rely too much on the economic arguments, such as currency deficits, to win the debate? Should there be a positive case? And if so, what is it? Yeah, it's, it's an awful lot harder um, to make the positive non-economic case. That's hard. Uh, because whenever you're saying no to a proposition, inevitably you are defending something that's not perfect. And you're not able to, to without sounding negative, highlight what the problems that may come uh, with an independent Scotland. Um, so inevitably it's harder whenever you're saying no to something. It's, it's much, much more difficult. Um, so that's why we've got to make sure that we work hard and understand what people's concerns are and give them hope that the United Kingdom can change, that it can be improved. Because the SNP always portray independence as the hope option. So we've got to have hope as an alternative. But that hope inevitably involves change as well. Yeah. And that's why the progressive forces in Scottish and UK politics have got to do a damn sight better than we are just now mm -hmm. in order to make sure that people have that hope. Yeah. Just to touch, you're saying about defending something that's not perfect. The Scottish Liberal Democrats 2021 election manifesto sets out your party's position for a federal UK. So clearly, in your view, which, is, which basically we've just said, independence isn't the solution, but neither is the status quo. But, you know, with Johnson's Conservative Party, the, the dominant force in England at the moment, which I know you would, you would debate uh, based on the by-election result, with no interest in ceding more power, would, you, would it be fair to say that your third way of a federal UK is for the birds? Uh, uh, no. Um, and the reason why is because what we are not saying with federalism is that you're having a massive transfer of individual powers over individual departments. We're not saying that. What we're saying is we need to have a better way of agreeing with each other across the United Kingdom. So in dry technical terms, we're talking about a dispute resolution procedure. We're talking about how do we make sure that on the big issues, we've got a common interest, we have a better way of agreeing than Westminster having the final say on every single occasion. And we've seen it through the pandemic, how that's possible to happen. Mm -hmm. So we need to embed that in a system, perhaps through the joint ministerial committees, to make it an intrinsic part of what the United Kingdom is. Just now we've not got that, and that needs to change. So do you think it, it, when people talk about federalism, they've got the wrong idea? Is it, is it more the principles of federalism, the notion that power isn't just handed down, but it's actually entrenched in the, the devolved authorities? Is it, It's about giving Scotland, in some ways, and the other nations and regions of the UK, more authority on big issues that affect the whole of the country. And with that, you can actually, I think it's in the interest of Westminster to make that happen as well, because it will make governing easier. If you can get the nations and regions bought into the decision-making process, you've got a better chance of it being implemented effectively. As soon as you do top-down decision-making, it doesn't work, because institutions revolt. They want to be part of the solution not just being told what the solution is. Um, just to pick up on that, do you think, obviously, with devolution, the devolution centres have changed, but Westminster hasn't really changed. Do you think that perhaps a, a, some reforms at the House of Lords, a, a second chamber of representation for the four nations could be an approach that might, might work? Yeah, I think it would do. I mean, we know the forces of conservatism across the United Kingdom prevent these things from happening. Um, and it's our job to convince them and everyone else that it's in that institution's best interests to make the change. So, you know, a fair vote system, elected House of Lords, a written constitution, the federalism structure, all of those things I think are essential for the proper maintenance of a modern United Kingdom. Um, but, you know, rather than it being necessarily a massive challenge to them, they should see it as of benefit to them to make this happen. Because it's true proper democracy these days involves all parts of the country rather than just the elite at the centre. 
Towards the end of this term of Parliament, Sturgeon is set to request a Section 30 order to hold a second independence referendum. It's expected that um, Johnson would simply say, now isn't the time. But the longer Johnson resists, certainly is how uh, the SNP and uh, Sturgeon wants to paint this, the more support for independence could rise. In this eventuality, the union, in the words of Kieran Marson, one of the architects of the 2014 referendum, this would be defined by know your place Scotland unionism. Given your opposition to holding a second independence referendum, is Scotland's place in the UK effectively destined to the subject of law rather than democratic consent? And I think our, I don't want to get to that position. I don't think um, I, that'd be fair to say. I, yeah, I don't think I don't think anybody on the pro UK side wants to get that position. Our opportunity over the next um, couple of years is to give people that hope that I was talking about earlier. That there is a different way of doing this. That we don't have to repeat the mistakes of Brexit. That there is a positive, internationalist, moderate, progressive future for the UK, and they need to turn away from nationalism and independence, which is divisive, and go for that, something that's much more positive. Now, that's my job over the next couple of years, to achieve that. Um, I hope, therefore, we never get to that position of that conflict. The SNP are desperate to have that. They like the argument more than, actually, the debate. Um, so is making sure that we're in a much more positive, hopeful position before we get anywhere near that. So just sort of summing up, then, Federalism, the principle of fed federalism could be a solution in your, in your opinion, whereas another referendum is for the long grass. What do you foresee this term of parliament being defined by? An effective COVID recovery, tackling the issues facing Scotland with the powers the Scottish government already has? Or do you foresee a parliament distracted by the ever looming prospect of another independence referendum, which just keeps going to happen, but never quite happens? It, I mean, in five years' time, the env political environment will look very, very different. It's got to. Um, Nicola, the, the nationalist movement, will have expected her to make significant advances on an independence referendum. I think she may struggle in that. And if she struggles, she'll have to go. Um, there's no way that she could continue without that. Everything's uh, focused towards that. Um, I think um, we'll be in a position of understanding fully the consequences of Brexit. And therefore, our view across the United Kingdom about internationalism, I think, will have changed, and certainly about the European Union. And my job over that period is to create a progressive, optimistic alternative that can challenge the two nationalisms that have dominated our politics for far too long and present something that's much more positive and optimistic for the country. That's our job. I hope the next five years is focused on the recovery rather than all those divisions. My fear is that both sides, both extremes, will be determined for that conflict to continue. Well, Irene, thank you very much for joining us. That does it for us here. The summit continues tomorrow with the leader of the Scottish National Party, Ian Blackford.